Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was wonderful. If you would take um, your presentation oh. uh, mm -hmm. back, then we would probably see each other uh, quite well. Uh, we are still 40 people and, and what we said um, in advance was that we um, encourage everybody to just, you know, jump in and start the Q&A with Kirsten because with uh, 40 people, it is not so easy to see you all at the same time and so on. And so we would really like to encourage you to jump right. I'm open for doubts also. Of course, for, for uh, interrupting you, for doubts. <laughs> you make the whole program, it's wonderful. <laughs> Nobody wants to doubt? I mean, I, I doubt a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, great, great. great. Bit, yeah? great. What do you doubt? Yeah, because... Um, uh, first, I would say what in this situation, um, I don't know, would I be in the Dr. Smith, uh, no, uh, the, the Smith position or... Um, the neighbor, you're a neighbor. Yeah, ah, you know, you're a neighbor. I, I think everybody is waiting for the sentence you would pose in this situation as a neighbor. Yeah, what would you say? <laughs> yeah, that's not okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what you say or uh, emphasize is that we have the uh, possibility or also the capacity to reflect culturally in this situation. And um, I think, okay, I'm at least interested in some little sentence which you would like to suggest. Um, I refuse that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I refuse it because it's like, oh, that's the best way. This is how Kirsten puts it. I really haven't even thought about it, to be honest. I haven't even thought about it. It's oh. simply, I kind of, I like this confusion and I, I like the idea of exchanging here. What would you say? Mm. How would you react? And of course, this is an artificial situation. We are not in the situation. Mm. So um, there is no best way. And I think this is really a trap in intercultural communication, as if there were a best way. There are just consequences. And some consequences you would like to, you know, uh, take, and I wouldn't maybe, and vice versa. Yeah. OK, so um, I go on with reading the chat. The chat. Uh, which gives us two wonderful opportunities to pondering a little bit on what you said. So uh, Yvonne um, Schopa said first, I wonder how this rather complex theoretical approach helps in that specific situation. That's one remark. And the other uh, regard from Ganguin Maya is, thanks a lot for your wonderful lecture, Kirsten. <laughs> and I would like to put that together, you know. Um, well, maybe when we hear it the first time, it seems to be complex, but I, I know that you know the theories and I, would I wanted to kind of combine the background idea with uh, the situation, but uh, I can tell from trainings, intercultural trainings, I'm doing this with all participants. They don't have any problem with it. I, I don't explain too much. I just say, okay, ask three questions. Uh, first question, cultural factors. Second question, what could be other influences, other categories, or how, what's the situation, the organization like? And the, the third question is, um, are there any privileges? And immediately, you know, I explain a little bit I give an incident or they take their incident and they do it in group works and immediately they come up with many ideas. And when I trained that with students and I'm speaking, I tried it not with students because when I developed that, I was working in 
um, administrative authority uh, in, in, in banks. I, I use it everywhere. Um, and what was really interesting for me and also for the participants was that they came up with at least three, but more often six or seven ideas, how they could react. And it's a training. You know, if we know the theories and we are experts, we should know a little bit of the theory. If we know the theories behind it, just one theory of each perspective is enough. Um, then we can, you know, um, train it uh, in, in seminars and give people more ideas than they had before. And I think this is a, a step forward in intercultural communication and learning. Wonderful. Thank you. I go to um, Ganguin Maya. She wanted to say something. Uh, as she put it uh, herself, in general, wait a minute. I hope, Gan, you also could um, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right now. Look at that. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the chance to say something uh, to Kirsten. Uh, in general, I have uh, talked about this is approach um, in the community of uh, a global network of um, international um, social work education. Um, and uh, our colleges um, have very, very much welcome uh, Kirsten's approach and uh, we are waiting for you to uh, talk about that maybe next next year in our uh, international conference of uh, international social work education in vietnam yeah in vietnam yeah oh i look forward to that yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah, thank you thank you so much um perhaps i can ask uh, my question <laughs> yeah please go on yes, thank you very much um, it's not the first time actually we discuss things. So um, I have a little advantage perhaps over others in this group. I fully agree with you that um, we should not encourage trainees, students, learners to come to conclusions too quickly because real life is too fuzzy for that. And sensitizing them to rethink their first response is absolutely what I share with you absolutely. What I'm not quite sure about is what actually is the positive side that we should teach them then? Is there anything beyond doubting their own first judgments or approaching the, the, the same situation, the same type of behavior, the same kind of irritation they experience from different sides? Is there anything beyond that proactive, for example, that you would suggest, or what, what do you do with your students? And yeah, and also with the participants of trainings, I would say they learn that culture is much more than just um, our different habits and uh, values and orientations. Um, they are more aware of, their, of the power map and they train to stand more the uncertainty we, we speak a lot about ambig tolerance of ambiguity, but um, it's not only interrupting my first reaction, it's also, you know, um, relying on the situation and on the others to help to find a solution. And this is an attitude and not so much what to say. Uh -huh. And um, I find this very interesting that it works, actually. And I, I, I if I might rem remind that I, use, I kind of developed it because I needed it in practice. It was never meant to be a theater theoretical approach. Now I kind of develop it further. Uh, but it was meant to help me in practice to do one thing and not ignore other good approaches in the field of intercultural communication mm -hmm. um, to deal with the situation for its purpose. Okay, thank you. 
Professor Mulejak, um, you, you will need to unmute yourself. <laughs> yes. I can't still still can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah. Okay, now, you hear me. Now. Thank you. Now. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, Professor. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm retired. Um, <laughs> we know. We know. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, well, sensitizing or reflexivity, these are very big concepts. But I think uh, basically it turns out that uh, people are and become able to come up with hypotheses about solutions. So what, what I seem to hear here is what, what um, has been said, uh, about what Kirsten has been, uh, said was that um, uh, people have to develop new categories of attrib attributing solutions to this kind of abstract situations um, and that's the goal. It is not the goal, and I agree, it's not the goal to give a solution for this uh, critical incident, but to teach that this kind of critical incidents are used to develop certain categories, in this case, uh, membership um, uh, categories, for example, which can be used to come up with hypotheses for a solution. So this, for me, is a competence. The rest would be knowledge. If somebody would say, well, they are Muslims and therefore, so then we are in the cause uh, effect uh, 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 category or, or schema. But this is, I think, not the aim of, uh, of a training because knowledge can be gained everywhere by books or by watching films or so. So my my understanding of what you said, Kirsten, is that, um, that the situation, the critical incident, has to be presented in a way that it raises uh, sensitivity or re reflexivity. And this means that they have to come up with new hypotheses, which they had not have, didn't have before. Is that right? Um, it's part of it. It's part of it. Um, I would say it's also about uh, being aware that we're always negotiating identities yeah. and positions and privileges. Um, and it depends on how we speak, mm. how we position ourselves, and to co-create uh, a new culture. Uh, and not to think I have to I have to solve it alone. Mm. Um, I when I train this in like they even have to write exams about it and say find at least three solutions mm. for this situation, mm. so that they switch and switching uh, and changing the perspectives and the personas and the identities is part of the exercise. Yeah. Actually, um, I. When I can dream, if I had a vision, I would say, what do we need culture for? I don't need it. It's just, you know, I don't want to go to the minimization stage of um, Milton uh, to say it, we are all human beings. But um, it's a possibility to reach the person without applying knowledge, without categorizing the other person uh, by opening up and by interrupting many, many discourses we are in. And especially when it comes to first semesters, I'm looking forward to the first semesters now, again, when they come to university, they are full of discourse. They are just full of linkages, what belongs together. And it takes a lot of effort to open them up to the situation, to the here and now. Mm. So, what do you think, Mr. Müller Jacquier, about that? Is that <laughs> is that an answer for you? Yes, I, well, I know the direction, but but I think it, it is maybe a little general. Um, what I mean, for example, if you could go to to language, you introduce the category language, you could say, 
as uh, come up with a solution like um, the public space in front of a door of an entrance door has a very specific meaning in different cultures. So um, it belongs to everybody. And as it belongs to everybody, nobody, nobody can use it in a private way, like putting shoes um, in front of the door and not behind the door, right? So this would be an hypothesis, one, one hypothesis, okay. Um, which goes back to the meaning of things. And, um, and I think that the category, he, category here in the network of categories um, would be um, the category of what, what, is, what is public, what is considered to be public and what is considered to be private. Because basically the, the only difference is that people put their shoes uh, on one side of the door and maybe in other communities on the other side of the door, which is very, <laughs> Uh, a, sim very, a very simple difference. But to learn that is not to learn or, or to, to, to deal with that is not to learn uh, they do it this way and we do it that way, but to go back to a category like what is the meaning of public and private space? Um, and maybe then for the next uh, critical incident, you don't apply the knowledge you gain, but the category public private space. So what I understand from you, what you are presenting is that, um, and what I'm saying is that we have to learn in intercultural trainings, a series of uh, connected interrelated categories, which we can then apply to generate new hypotheses, which I call hypotheses, you call solutions, you know, three possible solutions. Uh, and that's that's the goal, no? From your perspective, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. I'm I'm quite abstract, and this is uh, intentionally and consciously uh, very abstract. Um, yeah. Full stop. But thank you very much. It's yeah. Hypothesis. Maybe one one more sentence. Hypothesis is assumption, right? And solution is what I do. Mm. This is what I really say. Oh, okay. What I really say. Mm. And, w and w when I say something, I kind of create a piece of culture, how I react to this, mm. you know? And um, yeah, and, and I mean, this, this example with the shoes and a student of mine, she had this, this situation, exactly the situation. And it was not only the shoes, it was also the noise. It was, you know, it's about, they are different. They are strange. They are, yeah. and we have to think a lot about what is the house situation. Maybe qu uh, public and private, yes, but maybe there is um, live and let live. Maybe they have a kind of an implicit rule how to deal with it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I like to be abstract in, in that respect, to really, really get rid of yeah. this old, yeah. it, I, mean, I, know, I don't want to say that these are old and in, in not useful categories of private and public, but uh, I want more. I want more yeah. a, a identity I negotiation, I think. Well, May I just come in here, perhaps? Sure. I can follow you 100% up to this point, but looking at it from a point of view of intercultural communicative competence, I seem to be missing, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the doing, what do I do after I've understood and um, evaluated all kinds of answers, um, highlighted all kinds of aspects that might play a role. What do I do? That's why your example is actually very good, very useful. It seems so banal, but it's an everyday clash, potential clash. And unless you don't want to have this crisis of real open conflict, what do you do? And that, to me, is part mm. of competence. And I would, would you be very curious like, to just exchange, and you can be assured that I wouldn't say, oh, no, that's a bad answer. Uh, what would you do? What would you say if Mrs. Smith talks to you 
on the stairs in your house about the situation? What would you say exactly? And I, I think we, will, we would get a, a great selection now. And I would be very curious to learn, you know, what ideas are in your mind. What I would say, yes, please. Me, me, me. Yes, yes you, please. <laughs> okay, um, but in in my trainings, this is not part of the training because this, yeah. But let 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 us let us go. I would um, I would say something um, using a certain strategy. Uh, the strategy is uh, <clears throat> the the perspectivizing of what I say. So I would say, um, from my perspective, and then I could, you know, specify something. From my perspective, these shoes or these noises are interpreted in this way. I understand that maybe you have other perspectives. Maybe you have uh, a certain convention, a certain rule, um, but in the in the context. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> two different perspectives, and our task is, on, and our solution is, how to coordinate um, these two approaches to our common reality. Oh. So I, I, th this would be the way, but this is another, I think the way of speaking about cultural differences or for giving solutions, for mediating, this is, this is just another, uh, webinars. These are other, more ten more webinars, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I don't know whether this kind of solution. I mean, in 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 acting, uh, the solution is part of your training, Kirsten, he, uh, here, or is part of the the problem you raised here. Is it? Yeah, I always, oh. I always, I always go. You know, I come from conversational analysis, so I always go for speaking, always. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, I'm hesitant. I will late. I haven't. I promise. I haven't even thought about it. But I will kind of spontaneously. I will find something. So, I think it's Michael who always raises the hand, right? Yeah. I was just sure. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to suggest because Rudy asked. You, so, what should you do, or what can you do? And this is exactly what I was would like to suggest. Maybe have a con conversation. Maybe ask some questions. Clarify some things that are still unknown, yeah, the not known. Can I ask, uh, can I ask more, more, like more precisely, Michel, what would you exactly say? What would be the sentence? <laughs> um, I don't know whether I knew my new neighbor already well enough. Uh, so I would probably uh, say some very nice introductory words, just some warm welcome words to build a relationship first. Yes, it's more than one sentence. Uh, yeah, so um, um, may, may I rem I maybe ask, uh, yeah, I see you have your, all your family's shoes outside of the, of the door. Does it have a particular reason? Mm -hmm. Something just, no, something at the side, by the side, no, not, not make it the main topic, <laughs> now, for example. What I would like to um, maybe remind is that what is the exact situation we are speaking? I think this is very important in intercultural communication and we are speaking to the Smiths. Mrs. Smith is talking to me, that's the situation. I don't talk to the, yeah. the new neighbors, I could. I could say, oh, I, I Oh, now that you say it, maybe I talk to them. This is what you could say. So uh, if I yes. talk to Mrs. Smith, then I would ask, um, ask her which question did you ask your new neighbor? What did you learn about her? So, mm -hmm. did okay. you do some meta communication? Uh, sorry, M Michael, I didn't want to interrupt you. you. Uh, but I wanted to ask Helen if she could contribute on what she wrote in the uh, chat. And she said that um, exactly as Michael says, there seems to be an assumption that people would immediately address the issue. And I see, um, Helen, um, could you unmute yourself and maybe comment on this? Yeah. 
Yes, I mean, maybe I just misunderstood. I thought it was, uh, I didn't realize that it was uh, Smith talking to some other neighbor. I mean, my sense is that actually, I mean, we all know some neighbors, I mean, any of us can have difficulty with neighbors. Um, and usually, whether it's whatever the membership category you could say that is relevant we don't necessarily or maybe it's not the wisest thing to immediately go to the to the problem so you know it's sometimes a question of trying to understand some of the background situations and i can give you a really practical situation i mean we have some neighbors next to us who I have always felt were very strange in that whenever we said hello or something, usually they would not reply. Or then occasionally if there was some issue, they would come and have an argument. They uh, were not British, but they were English speaking. And then um, just two weeks ago, we'd just come back from holiday and found the wife committed suicide in her garage. And so that made me think, you know, people can act in ways for all kinds of reasons, sort of, you know, mental health issues and so on. And, you know, we, so to be honest, I was left thinking maybe I should have made more effort. They were, they were strange neighbors, but I didn't do much about it, you could say. And so I guess, you know, I, what I'm taking from what you are saying is there are no, there are no simple explanations for why people act in certain ways. The way the the thing was, was the, the critical incident was set up though, was trying, it was kind of indicating there are different conventions, like um, said the public private, the, you know, all kinds of things. But to me, you know, relationships are complex things and, and you don't go straight to, to dealing with something that you're unhappy with you have to go much further back, like Michael mm. said, and start to um, kind of get get to know people. Um, um, can I? Um, yeah, Kirsten, you may, but I, I might um, like to make it a little bit more difficult, if I may. <laughs> sure. Um, so my way to uh, respond to uh, some Mrs. Smith, who is telling me, about her bewilderment or complain, uh, complaint about the behavior of the new neighbor, I would use um, David Cantor's structural dynamics. And that is uh, to build up relationship that I give her a follow in a way that would say, okay, I'm sorry, I see that you are suffering or that you are angry or whatever it is. I would give her a follow. And then I would uh, go to the bystander and bring the reflection part, um, for example, and I like what, what um, Mr. Shakir said, the perspectivizing of my understanding of the situation. I would bring that into perspective, what I hear, and I would maybe say, I can understand that for them because I'm, you know, um, experienced uh, with maybe people from Asia and I would say, um, do you know that they uh, are not allowed to have their shoes inside or, but in a very friendly way? Yeah, and then I would probably say, how can I help you? So, mm -hmm. and that would be the move, yeah? So mm -hmm. I, I would do it this way. And um, my question mm. to you is also, when you said um, we, we hardly need culture, or I would, you know, like if, as if we could with 
without our biases talk to each other. That would be something like an ideal, which you, um, or as I understand what you said. And if we would be like this, like a, you know, blank piece of, of paper. Oh, my internet. If we would be like this, um, where does the ethics come in? I mean, to talk to somebody anyway. I mean, I could, without culture, I could just, you know, go on <laughs> while Mrs. Miss is talking to me. Yeah, I would say it's, uh, it's the easy part to answer. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's just, a, it's a fiction, right? And uh, we have these biases and we have cultures and we will have them maybe for the next 150 years, more or less. Uh, so we kind of uh, thinking ex negativo. So uh, Bettina was asking, what exactly did Mrs. Smith, what was concretely Mrs. Smith asking? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm, in the past 25 years, while I was doing intercultural thing, I became very, very modest in what is really possible for people to learn. And um, Mrs. Smith wasn't asking anything. She was, I will come back to that, what you just said. She was gossiping. She was kind of, you know, having a small, and there was this Muslim discourse around, you know. So there is a, a dangerous moment in this encounter. And um i think that it's it's imp important to be aware of the traps and to go away from the traps firstly and then see further if the if the other one is following uh for example i could say um have you had contact with them yet just to, out of interest you know and contact yeah. is an interesting difference maybe um when it comes to pictures and biases and assumptions and everything so um this is the only thing i think would, would, would be my aim in the situation is to be very modest what is the next step to get out of this discourse that is so dominant and that is kind of sometimes occupying our minds and our speeches you know when i listen to people even to colleagues um even to myself I find myself saying things I, it's it, incredible, you know, I'm kind of reproducing the whole stuff. So what can I do to get out of it? And, and I think I need all my attentiveness and all my awareness to get out of all these cultural knowledges we already have. And this is what I share with Gun. Um, she's still in the call, yeah, is to work from the Messian's part, to work from not understanding, to work from uh, forgetting. And I think this is my, my, my ambition at the moment. So that's why I'm kind of uh, stressing this abstract part so much. Thank you so much. Please unmute, unmute yourself, Jackie. Jackie, Jackie. Yes, Kirsten, thank you very much for this provocation. I, I think it's great. Um, I am a, a great advocate of clean language. I don't know if you um, know it, but I use it a lot in my facilitation. And I think here it would be most useful because I love coming from the not knowing place. We know nothing. We absolutely know nothing. And we know nothing about the person in front of us, regardless of whether they are immediately culturally different or not. We don't know. I cannot tell from looking at the people in front of me here who they are, what their background is. So then I like to get curious. So I would be actually not curious about the situation. I would be curious about Mr. Smith. I say all that. That's very interesting that you feel that way. Um, and then one of his words, say he said, uh, I don't like the shoes, let's say. I would say, oh, and you, you don't like the shoes? And just leave it hanging in the air and then see what he says. Mm -hmm. And he might say, no, no, I think it's terrible that they leave the shoes outside. Also, you, you believe that it's very bad for them to lose, leave the shoes outside. I wonder 
What, what provokes that thought in you? I'm interested, let's have a discussion about that. And I would just be curious and find out the knowledge which emerges from that so that we could perhaps get into a solution mode eventually, necessarily at that moment. Can I ask you, Jackie, this concept of clean language? I don't know that. Do you have any reference for that? Well, I, I yes, I've been using it for many years. It's uh, David Grove. He was um, uh, working in front, well, he's, he's actually a Maori and he studied storytelling and people and he noticed that facilitators used to uh, pollute the language of the person they were talking to by their own words, their own thoughts, their own actions. He was a psychotherapist originally and then he came to France and the UK and he gave lectures. Unfortunately, he died in 2008. And now James Lawley, Penny Tompkins, uh, Marianne Way uh, are taking his work forward. And it's a wonderful cross-cultural way of being with people, extremely respectful of their language and their mindset. And the questions are very short and very curious and slightly meditative so people calm down, which is nice in conflict situations. Mm -hmm. That's very brief. Thank you very much, Jackie. Very interesting. I think it's it's a lot about the attitude, how we put the words, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, the person might feel we. I'm, I'm in a social pedagogy pedagogy seminar at the moment, but it, this this was just you know how you put the words. And if you were in the in the a specific situation, uh, I would feel your openness, and this openness is working. It's effective. Mm -hmm. I I strongly believe in that. Yeah. Yeah, I believe Thank it you. too. Mm. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Maybe so, it's because of the time, aren't you? Yeah. You already he, he exceeded, I think. We exceeded, no, we, we, we leave it too. open. We leave it oh, open, you leave it open. until okay. uh, 6 30, but I oh, mean, okay. quite often we have this situation that it's okay. Can, can I ask a question? Yes, please, Peter. Kirsten, I, I, I recall from one of your slides the phrase, wait for something to emerge. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I'm not sure that I've understood. Yeah, there are two ways of, way, of this co-constructing thing. One way, um, those of you who work with systemic um, theory and also uh, methods, know that if you let go the knowledge in coaching or in therapy then there is a solution emerging you don't, i don't have to think about the solution i just open up for for a good solution and of course i have my ethical attitude i don't have to give this up but i have to forget a lot of knowledge and then all of a sudden this emerges now the phrase the exact phrase i took from sharma and he is using more a phenomenological approach. He's working um, in organizational development and in consulting, and he's working with um, international teams, you might know, Theory U. And <clears throat> it's difficult for him to describe, but if you do constellation work, you know that it works. If you kind of um, prepare the people to let go, and what he, what he means by letting go is, is to let go the ego perspective, to be um, um, to listen to the others, to let go the will. That's the most crucial and difficult part, I would say. To really let go the will for an interest, for a special aim. Then the group synergy will help that the solution emerges. And this is what, what his experience especially, and he calls it presenting. Um, and I'm trying to combine at the moment this uh, presenting thing on what I do on research on consolation work, the, uh, of how people speak to each other when they do consolation work and when they do um, a representative uh, perception into intercultural communication. Um, and what I 
um, can say at the moment, but it still needs to be, you know, um, thought through much more, is that you have at least three perspectives at the same time, like my perspective, the other's perspective, and the perspective of the ecological system. It's more a non, um, a non personal, a personal perspective. And when I look at the discourses or at the conversations in constellation work, I can tell that these, uh, this is possible because we interrupt the normal interactions the normal interactions like every question needs an answer um, or a normal interaction like if you blame me I'm going to defend myself things like that and if we interrupt this then there is a chance that uh, we find a co-constructed solution that's very briefly yeah. thank you and I, I can tell I, I need this every day because I have a, 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 a I'm I'm leading a bilingual program, uh, master students from all over the world, and if I wouldn't trust that the group would grow together and help, and uh, everything would work out uh, with this attitude um, and forgetting all the solutions I might already know because I'm older, I'm I read more books, whatever. I would never get along with it, but it works perfectly. It just works uh, with the three perspectives and then the emerging part. Why I was curious about this was that waiting for something to emerge suggests that people have time to spare. Uh, and, true. Mm -hmm. and whereas that might be the case in a therapeutic or coaching session, um, waiting for something to emerge in, in real time, real life, cross-cultural communication might not be so effective or appropriate. Well, um, it doesn't mean that you have to wait for two and a half years, but it's an intervention for people who are always in a hurry. It's a perfect intervention. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not, it's not to be taken so literally. It's, it's, it could be an intervention for someone who never takes the time to int for introspection, for um, intuition, for reflecting, for quick, quick, quick wins, quick solutions. It's a perfect interven intervention, either a paradox intervention to even speed up so that the system breaks down and opens up for new patterns or to just wait and say nothing. This would, I think, this is a perturbation that leads to a crisis that could help. Not in a manipulative way. I mean, it's always being, even if you do provocative uh, interventions or so forth, it's always, I, mean, I think people should know why are you doing this. So I, I'm always very transparent, definitely. Um, I'm a little bit lost because um, this is now also uh, mentioned in the chat by Judith. I'm not sure how this would work in the situation you described. I mean, um, there are so many possible perspectives and answers that um, even with this, you know, uh, concentration on three perspectives, and even given that at this time, everybody is well consulted by being slow <laughs> because we are doing too much in too less time always. Um, I'm also a little bit doubting about the applica applicability or viability of this approach. Of what approach? Especially um, what approach? What, what you described up to now um, yeah, so the three perspective, the cultural reflexivity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, letting go of all my prejudices and biases and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the provo provocation. Um, 
we could maybe for a start uh just take it like a like an exercise what would we say from the intercultural perspective we could mm -hmm. explain the private and the public or uh, the habit of not, you know, going with shoes to uh, on carpets, things like that. We could explain. Uh, we could also say, well, just imagine if you're new in a country, um, Mr. Smith, and you don't know the habits, maybe um, it isn't intentionally, it's just a different habit, you know, I could not only go for the cultural part, but go for if someone is new and needs to integrate and needs our help to integrate. And I could go for, and I'm just using these perspectives now, I could go for, who? no idea what to do there. I mean, this is, in a nutshell, the reaction from perspective one, two, and three. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking for solutions in everyday practice where I use all three of them in whatever order or combined in a synergy. And I found it helpful, but maybe it's not that convincing how I thought. May I just add something along the same lines, actually? I find it convincing. The only thing I would be missing is the relationship building aspect, in particular, in an initial phase of getting to know one another. And that connects with Helen's presentation a couple of weeks ago. How do you establish a relationship of trust, of mutual trust? And that's not a question of one sentence. Of course, with one sentence, you can destroy it immediately. But uh, that is what politeness is about, of course. And that's why I would focus a bit more on this aspect of relationship building over a certain length of time. And perhaps you mean it that way, and I missed that. And so you free to correct me. Well, well the interaction partners are not the, uh, uh, the family from, from Iran. It's the Smiths and me as yeah, a neighbor I'm, that's yeah, yeah. the interaction part and i have a relationship to them We're obviously not like on do basis what we have in germany but yeah. on z basis basis so um yeah i mean there are 10 different ways of building trust of as course. we know so it's complex yes of course it is yes of course it is yes yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. This was very stimulating, very helpful. And this is the idea of this series. We want to bring together different approaches and get ourselves discussing these things because that has been so, a bit of my uh, experience within Sieta. We don't do much discussing among each other. And that's going on just now. So I feel I'm quite happy actually. What about you, Antje? Um, I see the same in the chat. I mean, there are so many who say it was wonderful. I thank you. You inspired me and everything. So um, what, what can I add? It was wonderful mm -hmm. to have you, to have had you here. Yes. So. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And thank you, everybody else. And what we usually do is we clap our hands. Yeah. <laughs> Good boy. And thank you. thank you for coming and uh, being part of that. Yes. Uh, from Kirsten. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,